The alternate reality today at a stadium in Moscow as Russian President Vladimir Putin took center stage at a pro-war rally, praising his military despite what the world is watching. Missiles strike Lviv, Russian aircraft firing on the city in western Ukraine, just 40 miles from Poland's border, where NATO territory begins. Deadly new attacks in Kyiv, and the harrowing search for survivors after that theater turned shelter was hit in Mariupol. All as the refugee crisis grows even more dire, and some Ukrainians and Russians arrive at the southern border of the United States. High stakes diplomacy, a nearly two hour call between President Biden and Chinese leader Xi about what to do in Ukraine, days after Putin turned to China for help. What each superpower is saying tonight and the personal plea from Arnold Schwarzenegger to the Kremlin. Bullhorn to the world with lives upended by war, how some caught in the conflict are using platforms like TikTok to shine a light on what's really happening. I guess this is a bomb shelter. That is close to my house. And sending a powerful message on social media. I did not expect it to go that viral, uh, but then I understood that this is a powerful tool. A COVID reality check as cases once again climb around the world and concern grows over a far more transmissible Omicron subvariant. Moderna has joined Pfizer in requesting emergency authorization for a fourth shot. What do Americans need to know? Dr. Alok Patel is here. And the Festival of Colors, billions across India flooding the streets for Holi, a Hindu celebration of spring and a day of unlimited joy with food, dance, and fun. I need a lot of help here. <laughs> <laughs> yep, that's it. One. Well, good evening, everyone. I'm Kana Whitworth here in Los Angeles, in for Lindsay Davis, and thank you so much for streaming with us. Now, we begin tonight with the war in Ukraine and a new flashpoint as Russian President Vladimir Putin hits a target not far from where NATO territory begins in Poland. Airstrikes for the first time in the western Ukrainian city of Lviv captured here. This is verified image posted on social media showing a missile explosion near the airport. That is just 40 miles from Poland's border, a city now home to more than a million Ukrainian refugees. And in Mariupol, a search for signs of life after Russia bombed a theater that had been turned into a shelter. That city in ruins as civilian casualties climb. And on the phone today, President Biden and Chinese leader Xi, seen in this photo released by the White House, speaking for nearly two hours, just days after Russia's request for military aid from China. Putin also made an appearance today, speaking at a pro-war rally in Moscow. His defiance at odds with the damage he has caused. ABC News chief global affairs correspondent Martha Raditz leads our coverage from Lviv. Tonight, for the first time, Russia attacking Lviv, a bustling city which was considered a safe haven just 40 miles from Poland. <laughs> Verified video circulating on social media showing two of the explosions slamming into an aircraft repair facility near the main airport. The Russians firing six cruise missiles from the Black Sea, hundreds of miles away. At least two of the missiles were intercepted before they could reach their target. With today's missile strike just there beyond the airport, the Russians are sending a powerful message. Lviv has been a critical place for refugees trying to get out of Ukraine and a critical pipeline for humanitarian aid and supplies. And tonight, the sheer scope of the refugee crisis now all too clear. A U.N. agency today estimating that six and a half million people have been displaced inside Ukraine since the fighting began. Over three million have already fled the country, meaning nearly a quarter of Ukraine's population has been displaced. Russia's foreign minister, Sergei Lavrov, further raising tensions with the West today, warning that any military shipments to Ukraine will be considered legitimate targets. Any uh, cargo moving into Ukrainian territory, which uh, we would believe uh, is carrying weapons, uh, would be a fair game. Lavrov's boss, Vladimir Putin, appeared at a huge rally in Moscow today, before a flag-waving crowd of thousands, Putin repeated false claims that Russia's invasion was meant to prevent the genocide of Russian speakers in eastern Ukraine. 
Putin's speech was abruptly interrupted when the feed cut away to a lively musical performance in the stadium, the Kremlin dismissing it as a technical glitch. Plicho, plicho. Putin used the speech Pomagai. to praise his troops. But the reality is Putin's ground forces are stalled on the battlefield as the fighting enters its fourth week, prompting him to increasingly turn to long-range weapons staged in Russia itself to wage his war. The drawn-out fight and Putin's desperation has the U.S. and NATO worried that Putin will turn to even deadlier tactics, including chemical, biological, or even small-yield battlefield nuclear weapons to break the stalemate. The use of nuclear weapons on the battlefield is part of Russian military doctrine, and the horrors it could unleash risk involving the U.S. and NATO more deeply in this conflict. These are smaller yields, smaller weapons, but they still carry lots of radioactivity, and they're still a big step along the scale of escalation to strategic nuclear war. Ukrainian and Russian officials did hold a fifth straight day of ceasefire talks. <coughs> Russia's lead negotiator tonight claiming the two sides have moved much closer on the question of Ukraine giving up any ambitions to join NATO. But Ukraine saying it has agreed to nothing and wants an immediate ceasefire, Russian troop withdrawal, and international security guarantees. As the talks drag on, the suffering only gets worse. In the besieged city of Mariupol, it's still not clear how many casualties there may have been after a Russian airstrike on a theater serving as a shelter. Seen here in images from the Azov Battalion, a far-right paramilitary group now part of the Ukrainian National Guard. Ukrainian officials say as many as 1,000 people were inside. At least 130 people have reportedly been rescued, but hundreds remain unaccounted for. In the capital, Kyiv, another round of shelling today. Emergency responders racing to save civilians and put out fires triggered by the indiscriminate attacks. And back in Lviv, a heartbreaking moment today as 109 empty baby strollers were lined up in a city square to symbolize the 109 Ukrainian children killed in this war so far. And Martha Raditz joins us now from Lviv. Martha, Russia is increasingly using those long-range weapons, as you mentioned, because ground forces are stalled, and there are growing fears here. The stalemate might lead to Russia using these smaller, perhaps, nuclear weapons. Where do we realistically stand on that? Well, Kena, he is using those long-range missiles because he is frustrated by the bogged down convoys, especially around Kyiv. And as for those nuclear weapons, we have heard the head of the Defense Intelligence Agency say Russia will use that kind of rhetoric to project strength. They have been talking about the fact that they are a nuclear armed nation. But as far as we know, there is absolutely no hard intelligence that he actually will use them. But it remains a concern, Kena. And Martha, important to note here, Lviv, just 40 miles away from the Polish border, is there concern that these sudden airstrikes on Lviv could threaten the flow there of refugees into Poland? Well, there certainly is. I mean, this was the first time they have struck in Lviv, and this has really been a critical pipeline for refugees. Tens of thousands of refugees have fled here and also have stayed here as a relative safe haven. Uh, so there is concern that there could be more strikes. Kena. Martha, incredible work you're doing for us. We so appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you. We're learning new details tonight about the high-stakes talks between President Biden and China's President Xi. In the nearly two-hour phone call, President Biden warned of the consequences if China helps Russia. Our Mary Bruce pressed the White House on why President Biden made no specific requests of China. Here she is. A senior official said that the president was really sort of laying out his assessment of the situation to President Xi, that he was making clear the implications of certain actions, but that President Biden wasn't making specific requests of China. Why not, and given the stakes here? Because China has to make a decision for themselves about where they want to stand uh, and how they want the history books to uh, look at them and view their actions. Uh, and uh, that is a decision for President Xi and the Chinese to make. And Mary joins us now. So, Mary, that was quite a telling moment. Why is the White House being so overly cautious here? 
Well, Kena, the White House says they feel it's more constructive for them to be somewhat cautious to handle this delicately, and it appears to be very tight-lipped about these talks. The White House described this conversation today as detailed, direct, and substantive, but they aren't sharing those details with us, not publicly. What we do know is that the president was very clear with, with the Chinese president about the serious implications and consequences of aligning with Russia, but it's not clear tonight if President Xi got that message in a lengthy but rather Rather vague statement. The Chinese called it a candid and in-depth discussion, but they continue to hold their cards close. We simply do not know right now whether the Chinese have decided whether or not they're going to help Russia, either militarily or economically, or Kena, even if, if Russia, excuse me, even if China is prepared at this point to condemn the Russian invasion. Right now, the Chinese are still referring to this war simply as just the quote situation in Ukraine. Kena. Yeah, that stood out to me too, Mary Bruce. Thank you so much. And now to that staggering report on the humanitarian crisis. The U.N. estimating nearly 6.5 million people have now been displaced inside Ukraine. That is on top of the more than 3 million refugees crossing the borders to escape. Warsaw and small towns in Poland taking in as many people as possible. The population of Poland's capital growing 20 percent. Victor Okendo is in Warsaw tonight. Tonight, the displaced just keep coming from every corner of war-ravaged Ukraine, overwhelming major cities like Warsaw. But just 40 minutes away in the town of Milanovic, a community opening their doors to those most in need. And to be clear, you've never met before, right? This mother and son fleeing Ukraine, those bags containing all they could carry, but instead of staying in a shelter, a local Polish woman taking them to stay with her mother. Of the more than three million refugees spreading to countries throughout Europe, more than two million are in Poland. In this town of just 16,000 people, they've welcomed 600 refugees. Well, there's no way, I, as a dad, I can look at mums with kids, right, and not cry and think, what can we do? Andrew Edel's offering his spare cottage to 14-year-old Oleva's family. Oleva, pictured here with his younger sister, mother, and grandmother last May, fleeing Kharkiv That's along with his cousin yeah, after spending one. days inside this bomb shelter with their dog. Here it's uh, way better. First of all, no explosions. So you feel safer here? I feel way safer here. Tonight, all have a roof over their heads and beds to call their own. Oh. Victor Kendo joins us now from Warsaw. So, Victor, we know Poland has accepted more refugees than any other country. They've been granted access to health care and education, but tonight the government taking it a step further? Kena, there is a new initiative where Poland is now providing refugees with the equivalent of social security numbers. This will allow them to legally find work, apply for a mortgage, or even get a monthly bus pass. In just one day, 123,000 Ukrainians were given those new numbers. Kena. Wow, Victor, thank you so much, and thank you for reporting for us in Warsaw, Poland tonight. Also tonight, some refugees from Ukraine and people fleeing Russia have arrived on the doorsteps of the United States. They are at our southern border. Will Carr reports from Tijuana, Mexico tonight. The humanitarian crisis spreading across Eastern Europe is now at the doorstep of the United States. Families fleeing Ukraine and Russia, fearing for their lives, flying to Mexico, which unlike the United States, does not require a visa, then making their way up to Tijuana. I spoke to one Ukrainian family that left uh, Ukraine in late uh, February. Uh, they drove through a series of countries and then were able to fly uh, from Frankfurt to Mexico City, Mexico City to Tijuana, and then waiting here at the port of entry. Agata Marambi and her husband left Russia after protesting publicly against the invasion. We just needed to be somewhere far from Putin, far from Russia, far from war actions. But uh, then again, we don't know much about Mexico. Uh, we, don't, we don't know if it's a safe country. We don't think it's a safe country. Marambi is waiting to claim asylum at the U.S. border along with 30 to 40 other Russians. Some with their backs literally against the razor wire at the port of entry leading to San Diego. We've seen one woman who's pregnant and a number of kids. Their faces are sunburned. They've been sleeping on the sidewalks here and they're all desperate to get into the United States. Through it all, we witness an act of kindness. A Russian girl giving a Mexican girl some candy. A Russian man then handing out apples. A reminder that many here are struggling. 
the folks who just arrived either fled before the conflict started or right when it started. So we expect to see an even bigger wave of migrants coming through. ABC News witnessing Ukrainians go to the front of the line thanks to an exemption to Title 42 listed in this CBP document stating the unjustified Russian war created a humanitarian crisis. Title 42 was enacted during the Trump administration during the pandemic, citing public health concerns to refuse entry at the border and has been kept in place by the Biden administration. On Thursday, the Secretary of Homeland Security said Ukrainian and Russian refugees will have their asylum claims handled on a case-by-case -case basis. In February, the Customs and Border Patrol reported 769 encounters with Russian asylum seekers. That compares to just 72 encounters in February of 2021. And while we're told that the number of Ukrainians and Russians showing up at the border is still low compared to those from other countries, hundreds have already made it into the United States. But for those stuck on the other side of the border, like Marenby and her husband, all they can do for now is watch and wait. And our thanks to Will Carr for that report. We turn our attention now to the pandemic and the new Omicron subvariant leading to an increase in COVID cases in the U.S. and around the world. Moderna is now requesting emergency authorization for a fourth shot for all adults 18 and older. That follows Pfizer's request for the elderly to also be approved for a fourth shot. So the question is, is this fourth dose really needed? And what will the spreading subvariant mean for the state of the pandemic? Here's ABC's Whit Johnson. Tonight, in the latest push for another booster, Moderna now formally requesting emergency use authorization for a fourth shot for all adults. It comes just days after Pfizer made the same request for Americans 65 and older. Dr. Ashish Jha, just named the new White House Coronavirus Response Coordinator, says they have to follow the evidence. It may very well end up being that the fourth shot is helpful, particularly for high-risk people. Um, we want to see the full set of data and then I think make a decision after that. The concern is waning immunity. New research from Israel shows that a fourth shot boosted antibodies back up to levels seen after a third dose, but didn't significantly reduce the risk of infection. In the U.S., half of those eligible still haven't gotten any booster. And now with BA2, a more infectious Omicron subvariant, making up nearly a quarter of all cases across the country, health officials say it's more critical than ever to get that first booster. Anybody who's not gotten boosted uh, needs to do that. I think if we do that, we may get a small surge, but it's going to be kept to a minimum. We're going to be able to get through this. Health experts are closely watching the UK and Europe, where BA2 is fueling a resurgence. The US usually follows trends in the UK by about three weeks, but tonight Dr. Fauci is encouraged by one key metric. British hospitals are not yet reporting an increasing demand for ICU beds. They're not seeing an increase in intensive care unit beds usage, nor are they seeing any increase in all-cause mortality. So we just need to keep an eye out on it. And Whit Johnson joining us now. So Whit, we saw the new data from the CDC today on the effectiveness of getting that first booster shot. What does it show? Kana, this new research from the CDC really shows the importance of getting that first booster or a third shot, so to speak. During the Omicron wave, three vaccine doses help reduce the risk of being put on a ventilator or dying by 94% compared to those unvaccinated adults. And so from three to four here, any word on when the FDA will take up approval of a potential fourth shot? Well, Kane, it looks like the FDA is expected to take up that issue of a potential fourth dose in April. We're not clear on the exact date yet, but it's possible that during that review, they're going to look at the data and discuss boosters for both Pfizer and Moderna. All right, right around the corner. Wit, thank you so much. For a reality check now on the state of the pandemic, I am joined by ABC News contributor Dr. Alok Patel of Stanford Children's Health. Thank you so much for joining us. Hannah, thank you for having me. Thank you for the discussion. Of course. So as you can imagine, so many of us were hoping we're done with this pandemic. But as Dr. Fauci said this week, it might not be done with us. So in your view, do we need to be concerned about this BA2 subvariant? What do these rising cases mean for the near future of Americans? 
Well, Kana, the numbers tell us exactly what you just hinted at, is that we're not done with the pandemic as much as we want to live like it's 2019. And the reality is right now we're still losing over 1,000 Americans a day. And I don't want to say that we should blanket be concerned because we're in a much better place than we used to be with the level of vaccine and natural acquired immunity and the amount of treatments that are available. But the people who are paying close attention to this or who should be are those who are elderly, those who have underlying medical conditions, who are immunocompromised, or anyone out there who is still not boosted. You heard the statistic during the Omicron surge, a three-dose vaccine regimen was giving people greater than 90% protection against death. If you look at any other preventative measures in public health, whether it's life jackets, helmets, or seatbelts, that number is astronomical. It is beyond me why anyone out there will not go and get these vaccines when we know for sure that they are protecting us against any variant that's out there, including BA2. That is a really interesting comparison. And of course, I mean, a lot of us just took our masks off. We're finally feeling normal. Do you think that people are really going to be willing to put them back on? It's going to be difficult to actually get people to go back and put their masks on. But I think some reassuring things that we can point to are what polls have showed. Now, in the middle of February, Kaiser Family Foundation poll showed that about 50%, 56% of Americans wanted indoor mask mandates back in place. A recent poll of LA Union teachers said that uh, more than that, more of those teachers wanted indoor masks in place in schools. And then, you know, a recent poll, another recent poll, Axios Ipsos poll, showed that about three out of four Americans said that if virus numbers went up, they would be okay with wearing masks again. So I am hopeful a large percentage of the population, especially those who are at risk, would go ahead and put masks back on. But I think we may have rushed lifting masks when we went from one day saying 90% of this country is high risk, put a mask on, to all of a sudden the following morning saying, hey, 71% of the country is in the clear, take those masks off. It's hard to bounce back and forth between those mandates for a large population who doesn't like being told what to do. I get that. And you saw how quickly, though, people did want to take their masks off. So at this point in the pandemic, what about that? What about giving Americans the option for personal responsibility to make their own decisions about masking if these cases do surge rather than make a mandate? Well, that would be the ideal scenario to give people that autonomy. But the reality is, is that these decisions affect your community around you. They affect anyone else around you who might be high risk. And also, if people do go and get sick, they are then going into hospital systems. And we unfortunately don't have the most robust hospital system in times of surges. And we saw this play out during previous surges in this pandemic. This all gets me thinking back to the 80s when seatbelt mandates were introduced, New York State being the first one, and people fought back against it. And I think it goes back to the fact that people just don't like being told what to do. They want to take responsibility of their own actions. And unfortunately, some people out there aren't paying attention to the community around them in which they need to, especially when it comes to measures like getting vaccinated and or wearing a mask. And what about parents of young children? Many eagerly awaiting approval of vaccines for children under five, but also Many parents would prefer not to vaccinate their young children. Uh, of course, where are we at in this approval process? Do you think, in your opinion, that it is vital that healthy children be vaccinated against something that in many cases has little to no impact on them? Well, I, I wouldn't go as far as to saying it's little to no impact because even if children aren't winding up being hospitalized or worse, we're still seeing the effects of kids getting severely sick having long stretches of cold symptoms, developing long COVID or passing it on to others. But Kana, I think it's vital that parents are given the option, especially parents of kids who have underlying medical illnesses. I've taken care of kids under the age of five who have cancer, who are on immunosuppressant medications, and those parents are freaked out, especially as the right. world is opening back up. I unfortunately don't think we're gonna see an approval for these vaccines within the next month, maybe a little bit longer. And so it's just a little bit of a waiting game as so many people, parents of the 18 to 20 million kids under the age of five are waiting into these uncharted waters, which is even more reason we need to do everything we can to protect those who are most vulnerable. Right, it's really a different situation if you don't have a healthy child at home. It really is. And you know, I think if, if the last years have taught us anything, our health and our resources are something that we should feel privileged about and we should not take for granted. Well, we appreciate your time, Dr. Lok Patel. Thank you so much. Thank you. Happy Friday. And when we come back here, the evacuations as a massive wildfire destroys several houses in Texas. And Arnold Schwarzenegger is a mega star in Russia. And tonight, his personal plea to that nation has been viewed by millions. But will anyone in Russia see it? And up next, a generation of TikTokers showing us real life in a war zone. Stay with us.
He thought he was God. He's now one of the most vilified men in the world. He is the everyman. Zelensky is the Tom Hanks of Ukraine. The fact that a little nice Jewish boy is 5'7 is showing up this KGB agent in the Kremlin. What do you say to Americans who see Russia and you not only as a rival, but an unfriendly adversary? Two men at war. Which Vladimir will take over? The world is not going to be the same. Christopher Steele. The guy who picked a fight with two presidents, and he's lived to tell the tale. That now infamous dossier. Supposedly a tape showing prostitutes hired by Donald Trump urinating on a bed. It would be quite a tape if it in fact existed. I said take out the PP tape. It quickly became a question of how much of this was accurate. This is the stuff of movies. A lot of this is the stuff of movies. The story of epic proportions. Phony stuff. It's a bunch of crap. It changed history. We love what we do. Aww. Times are tough, but healing animals actually helps heal the community. Thank you so much. Representation matters. Kids see us, and they say, I can do that. You want to be a veterinarian one day? Yeah. That is awesome. You ready to be a critter fix? <laughs> what you think, bud? <laughs> Have you ever touched a cow? We get to do this as best friends. It don't get any better than that. We're healing with feelings. <laughs> I'm Dr. Bernard Hodges. And I'm Dr. Terrence Ferguson. And, and we're, we're the Critter Fixers. Fixers. Critter Fixers. New season Saturday, March 26th at 9 on Nat Geo Wild. Social media has become a way for us to connect to people no matter where in the world they are. And as the war in Ukraine unfolds, it has given us a window to the ordinary lives upended by violence. TikTok is now a main source of information for millions. The White House going so far as to brief the platform's 30 top stars last week about the United States' goals and how to direct aid to Ukrainians. ABC's Maggie Ruley shows us how TikTok is giving an intimate look at life during the war. For so many young people ravaged by the war in Ukraine, social media apps like Instagram and TikTok have become bullhorns to show the world what war looks like for ordinary people in real time. As the Russian invasion on Ukraine began, Zvenislava started posting on TikTok, the 18-year-old Ukrainian showing moment by moment as her life was upended, packing up a few belongings and heading to a bomb shelter. Her video hitting more than a million views. I was shocked. <laughs> I did not expect it to go that viral. Uh, but then I understood that this is a powerful tool to tell my story, to finally get, uh, get to people's mind about what's, what is happening. Before the war, Zvenislava was attending university in Lviv, doing things 18-year-olds do, going to bars with friends and traveling. She says she had a good life, a normal one. I loved my life before the invasion. I loved every single part of it. Was there a moment that it hit you that this is real life, this is happening, my, my country's at war? I wake up in the morning and I instantly start, start crying because I understand that my life has ended the way it was before and I never wanted this. And I'm 100% sure that all of Ukrainians never wanted this. Well, everybody here is contributing mm. somehow. And you For now, she spends her days on campus, helping however she can and documenting it all on TikTok. Only two weeks ago, this common area was a regular area where students came to study and where students just spent their time. Right now, you can see that there are a lot of masking nets being made and that everybody here is volunteering and not studying. Okay, so the video is here. When did you realize that you could start sharing your story and making a difference by Speaking on TikTok. I decided that it is my duty to tell my story and to share how the world now looks for me as a Ukrainian. This isn't the first war to be broadcast on social media, but in some ways, TikTok is helping shape the war narrative in a way we haven't seen before. Russian users are banned from uploading new content on the platform. And unlike some other apps, TikTokers don't need a large following for videos to go viral. Olga is a 31-year-old social media manager who lives in Chicago. She was visiting her mom in Kyiv, and like so many others, she was caught in the middle of Putin's war. I guess this is a bomb shelter that is close to my house. We were told that something might happen around 5 p.m., so we're just waiting. 
as the shelling intensified. She documented her eventual escape to Poland on Instagram. I'm currently at a bus station and we've been waiting for the bus to arrive for the past three hours. I am here in Lviv right now. I just can't believe that we were able to get out safely. I can see the border from here and actually I'm about to walk over there to see what's going on. Another daily update. Uh, we have settled in the apartment. Olga came to Poland with her mom. Her dad is still in Ukraine. Normal life was taken away, you know. So. <laughs> My mom didn't plan on moving anywhere. Like she likes where she lives. She likes her apartment. She likes her job. She likes her surroundings. She doesn't know when she'll go back to Chicago. For now, she spends her time helping refugees in Poland, but says she'll keep documenting her journey because it's only just getting started. Social media is just making things real and people are connecting to that way more and they get more involved. While this war is being waged by conventional means, this generation is finding a new way to keep people informed and reminding us there's still hope for the future. I believe that youth itself is a very powerful uh, community. Although we are young, we have so many tools and we have so many things that we can do in this world. It's not only about the adults and the older people, it's also about us young people. Wow, and that was Maggie really for us. Powerful story there. Still ahead here in Prime. The uproar continues after trans swimmer Leah Thomas wins a national title in women's swimming. And celebrating the holiday of Holy, an extraordinary explosion of color with a meaning that we will explain. And March Madness living up to its name. We take a look by the numbers. But first, our post of the day here from Time Magazine, a drone over a town square in Lviv. It's flying over an image of this five-year-old girl from Zelensky's hometown. Valeria is one of the thousands of children who have now become refugees during this horrific war in Ukraine. Is that the gun? That's not the gun. What is it? I won't ask you again then. Are you a Nazi? <laughs> the deeper you go into black markets, the darker it gets. Why hasn't anyone come out and spoken? It's about the money. That's all we do. Trafficked. New episodes Wednesdays at 9 on National Geographic. Is that the gun? That's not the gun. What is it? I won't ask you again then. Are you a Nazi? <laughs> the deeper you go into black markets, <laughs> the darker it gets. Why hasn't anyone come out and spoken? It's about the money. That's all we do. Trafficked. New episodes Wednesdays at 9 on National Geographic. This is American history. A violent white mob. A brutal attack. 300 black Americans killed right here in America. Now, it is time to uncover Tulsa's buried truth. The gripping story brought to light in a new podcast from ABC News. Available now on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. Welcome back, everybody. It did not take long for this year's NCAA basketball tournament to live up to its nickname, March Madness, with a historic bracket buster teeing up tonight's By the Numbers. 15. That is the seeding of the St. Peter's Peacocks, who stunned the number two Kentucky Wildcats in first round action, becoming just the 10th 15 seed in tournament history to pull off the feat. 17 million. That is how many brackets were filled out this year at ESPN.com. And after the Peacocks flashed their feathers, if you will, only 743 brackets remained perfectly intact. So that is just 0.004% of people who picked Kentucky to lose. 2,300. That is roughly the total student body at the tiny Jesuit University in Jersey City, New Jersey. Compare that to more than 22,000 undergraduates on campus in Lexington. And 8.5 million. That is the base salary in U.S. dollars of University of Kentucky coach John Calipari, one of the highest paid public employees in America. By comparison, St. Peter's coach Shaheen Holloway made $266,000 in 2019. So one of Calipari's assistants 
makes more than triple that. And St. Peter's will play seven seed Murray State in the second round. We forgot the number one, the shredder. Just one shredder for my bracket. That's all we need. Uh, the madness of March is just beginning. And we still have a ton to get you to here tonight on Prime. Stuck on Earth, why comedian Pete Davidson is no longer going to space. And we all know about the high gas prices being made worse by the war. But tonight, we'll really explain why. Also, why so many are happy that one prominent group is not listening to one request from beloved icon Dolly Parton. But first, a look at our top trending stories on abcnews.com. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. Is that the gun? That's not the gun. What is it? I won't ask you again then. Are you a Nazi? <laughs> the deeper you go into black markets, you could be putting your life at risk. The darker it gets. Why hasn't anyone come out and spoken? It's about the money. That's all we do. Trafficked. New episodes Wednesdays at 9 on National Geographic. National parks are incredibly safe places. A crime will happen. Hey, my mom. My wife had fallen in really critical condition. At that time, I thought it was just a tragic accident. There's still a lot of questions we need to ask. There were small things that didn't totally add up. This is two lives for Harold that have died now. I was shocked. Something's not right. For the first time, Russia attacking Lviv, a bustling city which was considered a safe haven just 40 miles from Poland. Verified video circulating on social media showing two of the explosions slamming into an aircraft repair facility near the main airport. The Russians firing six cruise missiles from the Black Sea hundreds of miles away. At least two of the missiles were intercepted before they could reach their target. And as Russia deals with franchises pulling out of the country, Burger King and Papa John's are here to stay for now. Burger King saying that it can't shut down hundreds of stores because its main franchisee in Russia has refused to do so. Papa John's also has no plans to stop operating the 190 stores in the country. Evacuation orders in effect in central Texas as the Eastland complex fire rages. Tens of thousands of acres burned, hundreds of homes evacuated. The fire right now is only 4% contained. Leah Thomas, a swimmer on the University of Pennsylvania's women's swim team, has become the first openly transgender athlete to win a Division I NCAA championship. I try to focus on my swimming, uh, what I need to do to get ready for my races, and just try to block out everything else. Outside of the arena, dueling protests. Leah Thomas will always have a male body. This dog whistle for transphobia, if we are going to allow Leah to compete, then we need to give her a chance to win. And a chance she will get. Thomas is advancing to the women's 200 freestyle final and her second chance to win big at the NCAA championships. The House has voted to pass the Crown Act legislation that would ban race-based hair discrimination on the basis of hair texture and hairstyles, like hair that's tightly coiled, curled, or worn in protective hairstyles like locks or twists. President Biden has already said he'd sign the bill, but first, it heads to the Senate. Dolly Parton is still on the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame ballot, despite the Queen of Country's wish to respectfully bow out of contention. It kind of would be like putting ACDC in the Country Music Hall of Fame. It just felt a little out of place for me. The Hall of Fame Foundation saying in a statement, we are in awe of Dolly's brilliant talent and pioneering spirit and are proud to have nominated her. Dolly tried to decline the nomination earlier this week, writing on social media, I don't feel that I have earned that right. 
saying she didn't want votes to be split because of her. The only country artist among the 17 nominees to the Hall's 2022 class, including Lionel Richie, Pat Benatar, Dionne Warwick, and Eminem. There's some straight up rootsy rock and roll songs that she could just, she could just tear up. No trip to space for a Saturday Night Live star. Pete Davidson bowing out of Blue Origin's next flight after Jeff Bezos' company rescheduled the launch for more testing. And tonight we are following developing news overseas. This is in Norway. So right now search and rescue crews are there. They're looking for a missing U.S. Marine Corps Osprey aircraft with four on board. 3,000 U.S. Marines are currently in Norway participating in a massive NATO exercise. It's called cold response. What you're looking at here are photos of similar aircrafts taking off. This was a few days ago in Norway. The weather conditions in the area have been challenging these past few days and they're expected to get worse. Now to the severe weather threat from Florida to New York as we start the weekend. At least six people hospitalized when dangerous storms damaged their homes in Alabama. The system now moving into the Northeast tomorrow and a new coast to coast storm coming right behind it. Let's bring in ABC's chief meteorologist Ginger Z. Hey Ginger. Hey, Kana, you know, I'm standing here along the Hudson River and it's cold because we've got the wind off of that cold water, but we made it into the low 70s elsewhere and it was all that heat up ahead of these storms that's going to really start to power. So we've already seen 21 reported uh, severe storms. Two of those were tornadoes in the Florida panhandle, but that front is now moving to the east and I-95 becomes the target area tomorrow. So anyone from Myrtle Beach and Wilmington down to Savannah, uh, Charleston, all included there. But you see the little pocket along that cold front and closer to the low that's up in central Pennsylvania, Syracuse, New York. That's tomorrow afternoon or early evening. So depending on your outdoor plans or if you've got something like a barbecue going, I really think folks that are uh, looking in that yellow area need to be on a alert for what could be easily damaging winds or even an isolated tornado. Then we're watching this new storm. This thing's going to drop out lots of cold air behind it, and it looks super powerful. Spring begins 1133 AM Eastern time on Sunday. The first full day of spring on Monday could unfortunately have an outbreak of severe weather. We will be covering it the entire time. Kena. OK, our thanks to you, Ginger. Thank you. And next tonight, California's former governor, Arnold Schwarzenegger's personal plea to Russians trying to break through Moscow's crackdown on the facts about the war in Ukraine. Schwarzenegger is hugely popular in Russia, and his video slamming Putin and warning the Russian people about propaganda has been viewed millions of times online. But the real question here is, has anyone in Russia actually seen it? Chief National Correspondent Matt Gutman has that story. Tonight, there's no way of knowing just how many Russians have seen the message from Arnold Schwarzenegger. But he is extraordinarily popular there, and this was personal, his plea to stop the war. I'm sending this message through various different channels to reach my dear Russian friends and the Russian soldiers serving in Ukraine. He told the Russian people and soldiers, you are not being told the truth. I ask you to help me spread the truth. Let your fellow Russians know the human catastrophe that is happening in Ukraine. Gentle and fatherly, the former California governor and actor begins with a story about his own boyhood hero, a Russian, Yuri Vlasov, then the world's strongest man. Let me just tell you about the Russian who became my hero. In 1961, when I was 14 years old, he reached out to shake my hand. <laughs> he was kind and he smiled at me. I would never forget that day, never. His story, a way to connect personally with the Russian soldiers. And Schwarzenegger, just one of three American public figures followed by the Russian presidency on Twitter. And he has a message for President Putin. To President Putin, I say, you started this war. You're leading this war. You can stop this war. Schwarzenegger then telling Russian soldiers about his own father and the guilt he carried fighting for the Nazis in World War II. He says his dad came home a broken man. He lived the rest of his life in pain, pain from a broken back, pain from the shrapnel that always reminded him of these terrible years, and pain from the guilt that he felt. Schwarzenegger closing by saying those brave enough to stand up to Putin and against this war are his new heroes. The world has seen your bravery. 
we know that you have suffered the consequences of your courage. You have the strength of Yuri Petrovich Vlasov. And Matt Gutman reporting for us. Our thanks to you, Matt. Now I want to show you something in Texas. People there going a little old school because of the recent surge in gas prices. Yep. That's a way to get to work, isn't it? These folks are just outside of Dallas and they say the pain at the pump has forced them to get around on horseback. Now, we all don't really have access to horses here, but we're all struggling with the high price of gas. And the question really is here, if Russian crude oil accounts for just about 3% of all U.S. overall supply, what is really causing the pain at the pump? Our Elizabeth Schulze helps us set the record straight. Since Russia launched its invasion of Ukraine, you've probably been hearing a lot about record high gas prices. The national average price at the pump is up nearly a dollar in just the past month, meaning Americans are spending about a quarter billion dollars more every day for gas. So why is it that this devastating war halfway around the world is causing higher prices here in the U.S.? The first thing to understand is that Russia is the third largest producer of crude oil in the world, after the U.S. and Saudi Arabia. Crude oil is the most important factor in the cost of gasoline, accounting for about 56% of the price per gallon. What else factors in? Federal and state taxes, and refining and distribution costs. Those are the costs of turning crude oil into gas and actually delivering it to your local station. Now, the U.S. doesn't import very much of its crude oil from Russia, just 3% of all oil imports last year. We get most of our crude from Canada and Mexico. It's a lot less than countries in Europe, where about 34% of their oil imports come from Russia. That explains why European countries are resisting bans on Russian oil like the U.S. did. But if the U.S. doesn't rely that much on Russian oil, why are gas prices higher here? The answer comes down to economics 101, supply and demand. Oil trades in the global market. Think of it like one big pool that every country draws from. If the amount in that pool goes down, it means less supply for everyone. If supply goes down at the same time that demand is up, prices rise. Demand has so far stayed strong during this crisis. People are still driving and taking flights, which requires fuel. The world's dependence on Russian oil is sparking renewed calls to wean off of it altogether, say by shifting to electric vehicles. But Russia can't be removed from that equation quite so easily either. While energy is Russia's biggest export, it also produces 6% of the world's aluminum and 6% of nickel. Turns out those are raw materials key to electric vehicle production. Nickel prices more than doubled when Russia invaded Ukraine. That would make EV production more expensive. So the reality is when a major supplier of oil or other commodities like Russia risks getting cut out pretty much overnight from the global market, it'll take time to find a replacement. Until then, you might be feeling the pinch thousands of miles away. That is the truth. Elizabeth Schulze, thank you so much. Also, this Sunday is spring equinox, marking the official end of winter. So tonight, we celebrate the start of spring, as over a billion people do in India, through the celebration of Holi, the Hindu festival of colors. And it's all about dancing, great music, food, and all of that getting a little bit messy, but in a very fun way. ABC's Zoreen Shah shows us how. The Festival of Colors is in full swing. Known as Holi, the Hindu festival celebrates spring with a day of unlimited joy. My favorite part of Holi is definitely the play. Also a celebration of love. Billions in and around India flooding streets, covering friends and strangers in vibrant colors and water. You know, it's the one time of year you can really break all the rules, get dirty, and let all of your colors show. Kind of like this. The holiday representing good, triumphing over evil, packed with music and dance. LA dance company B-Funk is gearing up for their annual rooftop holy class 
teaching Indian dance with the festival's spirit. It's bright, it's vivacious, it's loud. It's a way to just celebrate, and what better way than to have a dance class and then have color on top of that. The first thing we do is kind of just get everyone playing holy right away. We teach the class, and at the end, we pick select groups, bring people out to the center so they can perform for one another. We grew up in America, born and raised here, but we're always longing for that culture, and we're always trying to find ways to not just speak about our culture, but show it. And so this is a way to show it with our friends and family out here and say, hey, this is a part of my upbringing. This is a part of my culture and let's share it. Now you're gonna lift up that left leg. We got a sneak peek at right this year's arm, choreography. And, and four, switch. Five, and I tried and to learn six. some of their moves. <laughs> and I eight. lose all rhythm when I switch. Well, not that I had any. Yes. I think I got and it, again. I think I got it, you guys. Yep. I hey. might be brown, but I need a lot of help here. <laughs> The festival is also celebrated as a Thanksgiving for Good Harvest. It's not a true holy without some tasty food. Celebrity chef Wolfgang Puck and Indian restaurant Badmash are teaming up to present a four-course holy meal. Chef Wolfgang, I'm hearing that your team actually initiated this partnership. Why was it so important for you guys to celebrate holy at your restaurant? This is the perfect year because we went through so much over so many months or years we can celebrate. I think that we are better off, everything is better. Forget about the darkness, forget about the cold. What was your reaction the moment you got a call from Wolfgang Puck's team saying, we wanna work with you guys on a holy dinner? Let's do it. Let's cook together, let's celebrate. Uh, let's make this a big thing and make it something that everyone can enjoy. Chef Wolfgang has been um, down with different cultures for a long time and, and showing America different flavors from many different parts of the world. Give me a little bit of this. Lentils, a popular dish in India and Austria where Puck was raised. My mother made a soup with pork in it and everything. And uh, the Indian, I like it better because it's spicy. You like it better than your mom's? Yeah. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> oh, no. Sorry, Mom. I didn't want to say that. <laughs> These dishes, traditional Indian, but with a modern twist. A lot of it, which Badmash does really well as well, is that uh, melding between, you know, classic cuisine and then innovation. A lot of our restaurant Merwa is about Southeast Asian fusion. Not a lot of the menu really consists of Indian food, though. So this is kind of the perfect pairing. The team calls those innovations elevations. Show me one of the elevations here. Ooh, I'm gonna start with this, the samosas right here. So these are lobster samosas. Wow. I've never packed lobster in a samosa, but we did it <laughs> and they're fabulous. They're promising a feast to remember with one simple goal. A delicious, tasty holy. Okay, so holy is about having a lot of fun. I have some holy powder in my hands and I am getting covered and so are they. Holy is also about celebrating with family. I have my young cousins right here and it's about meeting a lot of new friends as well. It's about music, it's about dancing. You saw this in Screethy of New Jersey right there. And every celebration has drums. Our type is called the Dole right here. Look, Holy has been celebrated for thousands of years, but I will say growing up in America, I really didn't celebrate Holy, and a lot of my friends didn't either, but it feels like that's changing. For the first time, we have a celebrity chef who is celebrating Holy. You have a rooftop Holy dance class that's been going on for the last two years. Holy is about new beginnings, and this really feels like the beginning of celebrating Holy in America. Ada. Zoreen, that is such a fantastic story. Thank you so much. We learned so much. And when you showed those samosas, we all had growling tummies in here. Fantastic. But before we go tonight, the image of the day, refugee children who've managed to escape the war in Ukraine, celebrating the Jewish holiday of Purim, traditionally marked with costumes and parties to celebrate the biblical era survival of the Jewish people in Persia from an attempted genocide. These children today escaping another conflict, but getting a chance to smile. And that's our show for this hour. Stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thank you so much for streaming with us.
And coming up in the next hour, will China play a bigger role in the Ukraine-Russian war? We'll dissect the high-stakes Biden G call. Also later, the former police officer pleading guilty for his role in the January 6th attack at the Capitol. Stay with us. ABC News, America's number one news source. I risked my life. I put my family in danger. If I was caught, they would have put a bullet in my head. But it was the right thing to do. It was the only thing to do. Terror plot foiled in Garden City, Kansas. That would have been one of the most deadly acts of domestic terrorism ever in the United States. It would have been Oklahoma City. He put his family himself in jeopardy for us. National parks are incredibly safe places, but crime will happen. Hey, my mom. My wife had fallen in really critical condition. At that time, I thought it was just a tragic accident. There's still a lot of questions we need to ask. There were small things that didn't totally add up. This is two lives for Harold that have died now. I was shocked. Something's not right. Admit it, these days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA 3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. And welcome back. I'm Kana Whitworth. Thank you so much for streaming with us. And we are monitoring several developments here at ABC News at this hour. First of all, the new Omicron subvariant is causing a rise in COVID cases. And now Moderna is requesting emergency authorization for a fourth shot for adults 18 and older. It comes just days after Pfizer made the same request for Americans 65 and older. And a former police officer pleads guilty to conspiracy for the January 6th riot at the Capitol. Jacob Fracker, who served in Virginia, agreed to cooperate with prosecutors and faces up to five years in prison. Another former officer, Thomas Robertson, pleaded not guilty and faces up to five years. A former West Virginia state lawmaker, Derek Evans, also pleading guilty to civil disorder. He was part of the Capitol attack just weeks after being sworn into office. And police in Arizona are investigating a terrifying ordeal for nine employees of a jewelry store in Glendale. They say four armed men stormed into the store, threatening them before leaving with one and a half million dollars and jewelry. One of the hostages, though, did manage to call 911, and police were able to arrest the four suspects. And now to the war in Ukraine and Lviv suddenly in the crosshairs for the first time since the Russian invasion missiles hit the city. It's just 40 miles from the Polish border. A senior defense official reports that Russian ground troops are still stalled, fueling fear that Vladimir Putin might turn to chemical or biological weapons to break the stalemate. ABC's chief global affairs anchor, Martha Raditz, has the latest from Lviv. Tonight, for the first time, Russia attacking Lviv, a bustling city which was considered a safe haven just 40 miles from Poland. <sighs> Verified video circulating on social media showing two of the explosions slamming into an aircraft repair facility near the main airport. The Russians firing six cruise missiles from the Black Sea, hundreds of miles away. At least two of the missiles were intercepted before they could reach their target. With today's missile strike just there beyond the airport, the Russians are sending a powerful message. Lviv has been a critical place for refugees trying to get out of Ukraine and a critical pipeline for humanitarian aid and supplies. And tonight, the sheer scope of the refugee crisis now all too clear. 
a UN agency today estimating that six and a half million people have been displaced inside Ukraine since the fighting began. Over three million have already fled the country, meaning nearly a quarter of Ukraine's population has been displaced. Russia's foreign minister, Sergei Lavrov, further raising tensions with the West today, warning that any military shipments to Ukraine will be considered legitimate targets. Any uh, cargo moving into Ukrainian territory, which uh, we would believe uh, is carrying weapons, uh, would be a fair game. Lavrov's boss, Vladimir Putin, appeared at a huge rally in Moscow today, before a flag-waving crowd of thousands, Putin repeated false claims that Russia's invasion was meant to prevent the genocide of Russian speakers in eastern Ukraine. Putin's speech was abruptly interrupted when the feed cut away to a lively musical performance in the stadium, the Kremlin dismissing it as a technical glitch. Putin used the speech to praise his troops. But the reality is Putin's ground forces are stalled on the battlefield as the fighting enters its fourth week, prompting him to increasingly turn to long-range weapons staged in Russia itself to wage his war. The drawn-out fight in Putin's desperation has the U.S. and NATO worried that Putin will turn to even deadlier tactics, including chemical, biological, or even small-yield battlefield nuclear weapons to break the stalemate. The use of nuclear weapons on the battlefield is part of Russian military doctrine, and the horrors it could unleash risk involving the U.S. and NATO more deeply in this conflict. These are smaller yields, smaller weapons, but they still carry lots of radioactivity, and they're still a big step along the scale of escalation to strategic nuclear war. Ukrainian and Russian officials did hold a fifth straight day of ceasefire talks. Russia's lead negotiator tonight claiming the two sides have moved much closer on the question of Ukraine giving up any ambitions to join NATO. But Ukraine saying it has agreed to nothing and wants an immediate ceasefire, Russian troop withdrawal and international security guarantees. As the talks drag on, the suffering only gets worse. In the besieged city of Mariupol, it's still not clear how many casualties there may have been after a Russian airstrike on a theater serving as a shelter. Seen here in images from the Azov Battalion, a far-right paramilitary group now part of the Ukrainian National Guard. Ukrainian officials say as many as 1,000 people were inside. At least 130 people have reportedly been rescued, but hundreds remain unaccounted for. In the capital, Kyiv, another round of shelling today. Emergency responders racing to save civilians and put out fires triggered by the indiscriminate attacks. And back in Lviv, a heartbreaking moment today as 109 empty baby strollers were lined up in a city square to symbolize the 109 Ukrainian children killed in this war so far. And Martha Raditz joins us now from Lviv. Martha, Russia is increasingly using those long-range weapons, as you mentioned, because ground forces are stalled, and there are growing fears here. The stalemate might lead to Russia using these smaller, perhaps, nuclear weapons. Where do we realistically stand on that? Well, Kena, he is using those long-range missiles because he is frustrated by the bogged down convoys, especially around Kyiv. And as for those nuclear weapons, we have heard the head of the Defense Intelligence Agency say Russia will use that kind of rhetoric to project strength. They have been talking about the fact that they are a nuclear armed nation. But as far as we know, there is absolutely no hard intelligence that he actually will use them. But it remains a concern, Kena. And Martha, important to note here, Lviv just 40 miles away from the Polish border. Is there concern that these sudden airstrikes on Lviv could threaten the flow there of refugees into Poland? Well, there certainly is. I mean, this was the first time they have struck in Lviv, and this has really been a critical pipeline for refugees. Tens of thousands of refugees have fled here and also have stayed here as a relative safe haven. Uh, so there is concern that there could be more strikes. Kena. 
Martha, incredible work you're doing for us. We so appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you. We're learning new details tonight about the high stakes talks between President Biden and China's President Xi. In the nearly two hour phone call, President Biden warned of the consequences if China helps Russia. Our Mary Bruce pressed the White House on why President Biden made no specific requests of China. Here she is. A senior official said that the president was really sort of laying out his assessment of the situation to President Xi, that he was making clear the implications of certain actions, but that President Biden wasn't making specific requests of China. Why not, and given the stakes here? Because China has to make a decision for themselves about where they want to stand uh, and how they want the history books to uh, look at them and view their actions. Uh, and uh, that is a decision for President Xi and the Chinese to make. And Mary joins us now. So, Mary, that was quite a telling moment. Why is the White House being so overly cautious here? Well, Kana, the White House says they feel it's more constructive for them to be somewhat cautious to handle this delicately. And it appears to be very tight-lipped about these talks. The White House described this conversation today as detailed, direct, and substantive, but they aren't sharing those details with us, not publicly. What we do know is that the president was very clear with, with the Chinese president about the serious implications and consequences of aligning with Russia. But it's not clear tonight if President Xi got that message in a lengthy but rather rather vague statement. The Chinese called it a candid and in-depth discussion, but they continue to hold their cards close. We simply do not know right now whether the Chinese have decided whether or not they're going to help Russia, either militarily or economically, or Kena, even if, if Russia, excuse me, even if China is prepared at this point to condemn the Russian invasion. Right now, the Chinese are still referring to this war simply as just the, quote, situation in Ukraine. Kena. Yeah, that stood out to me too, Mary Bruce. Thank you so much. Thank you. This call is just another chapter in a long, complicated history between the U.S. and China. Joining us now for a closer look is Robert Daly, the director of the Kissinger Institute on China and the United States at the Wilson Center. Robert, thank you so much for joining us. Good to be with you. So the White House extremely concerned, obviously, that China will step in to help Russia in this war. Do you think they will do that militarily? I think that's unlikely. It would be very high risk for China. China's already paying a reputational cost for not condemning Vladimir Putin's invasion. And if they were to provide weapons uh, to Russia, they would probably be discovered on the battlefields in Ukraine. And that is not in China's interest. So I think that direct military assistance of that kind is quite unlikely. Okay, so what about could China help Russia economically as a way around all these crippling sanctions imposed on the country? What specifically could China offer up in that way and how immediate would that impact be? So China is already a major buyer of Ukrainian natural gas, I'm sorry, of Russian uh, natural gas, oil, uh, also its grains. Uh, but it cannot buy enough to make up for uh, the degree to which sanctions from the uh, EU and the United States are hurting Russia. So it can take a little bit of the edge off, but it can't really block the damage to the Russian economy. And what do you think, in your opinion, is on the back end for China? Uh, why would they get involved here? Well, they're, they are going to wait this one out if they can. Mm -hmm. They probably have a few weeks of running room left. They are not going to condemn uh, the invasion, and they'll continue to make very bland, uh, contradictory, useless statements on either side of the issue. They will keep saying that Russia's legitimate security interests should be respected, although they never define what those legitimate interests are. But they say at the same time that the sovereignty and the territorial integrity of Ukraine uh, should be respected and that, of course, peace is better than war and that there should be uh, some sort of resolution through negotiation. So this costs China nothing and it positions it uh, if there is an end to this, a negotiated settlement, to claim that China was correct to call for negotiation. So they'll, they'll wait this out and remain bland. Some sort of cryptic language, if you will. Now, the White House says that President Biden warned China of the, the implications and consequences that would follow if China was to actually help Russia. What kind of consequences would realistically make China back away if they were making a decision to move forward and help? Well, we haven't been specific about that because it's it's very hard to name a set of sanctions that would really bite in China that wouldn't also hurt us. 
already Americans are paying for the sanctions against Russia. Uh, and those sanctions, of course, come uh, on, the, on the back of inflation that was already rising in the United States. We are far more deeply integrated with China's economy. So any real mm -hmm. sanctions would hurt American consumers in the form of higher prices and would hurt the profits of American corporations in China. So I think China may suspect uh, that we are in part bluffing and that we are not willing to harm ourselves to harm China. Sure. And speaking of vague language here, the White House also vague about whether this conversation was positive or productive in any way. And in the readout, President Xi referred to the invasion of Ukraine by Russia as a situation. So we know China, as you mentioned, has not condemned Russia's actions publicly. But should we be reading into that use of language there? Uh, Xi Jinping has now referred to the war in Ukraine and the Chinese media, which are, of course, all controlled by the Communist Party, usually call this now the, the Russian-Ukrainian war, or they speak, they use the Russian language and say that this was a special military action. They mm -hmm. haven't used the word invasion. I think they're unlikely to. It doesn't gain them anything now. And one of our ABC contributors, Steve Ganyard, former Deputy Assistant Secretary of State, says the readout of this conversation suggests that whatever the White House was worried about in their intel they had last night, they are still worried about. So what do you think that is specifically? Well, uh, they clearly have some intelligence which they mm -hmm. analyze, which they interpret as meaning that China is protect, perhaps open to helping Russia in some way. They haven't been specific about what that might be, but there have been suggestions that Russia might have asked China, for example, for drones that could be used in a military setting. And we want first to make sure that China doesn't provide this kind of aid. But secondarily and importantly, we want to make sure that if China does, the whole world knows it and that China mm -hmm. is tarred with the same brush as Russia. Uh, and China, of course, hears that threat, which is one of the reasons that it gets its hackles up. Incredibly important perspective. Robert Daly, our thanks to you. Thank you. And now to more of our coverage of the war in Ukraine here and the race to save the country's precious art. The people of Ukraine are struggling to protect their history as they also fight to protect themselves. ABC's Maggie Ruley has that story. A country in a race against time to save their history. This statue of Jesus from the medieval era taken down for what's believed to be the very first time since World War II. Hundreds of sandbags covering this statue in Odessa and priceless art from the National Museum now hiding underground. Already a country suffering from the heartbreaking loss of human life, now in a fight to save their culture from destruction. Do you think President Putin is trying to erase your Ukrainian culture? Yes, absolutely, yes. I don't know how to say it in Ukrainian. He wants to just to drink our, you know, all the juices from this country. In hard hit Kharkiv, the windows blown out of the main art museum, threatening the thousands of pieces of art inside. Seeing that destruction in the east, Andrei Saluk and his team from an NGO that works to protect historical landmarks in Lviv got to work as soon as Russia invaded. Oh, there's stained glass behind there. Yes. Dozens of volunteers wrapping this centuries-old statue in fireproof insulation and fortifying the walls outside of this chapel built in the 1600s. All around Lviv, there's just this constant hustle. We see statues that get wrapped up. These guys are sandbagging, trying to protect the front of the church, the church from the late 1300s. You can see a paneling that's been put up to protect the stained glass. This is a piece of history that bombs are threatening right now. And people here say they will do anything they can to protect their culture. Lviv is a city built on history and its citizens are determined to save it. How old is this building? Uh, 16th century. 16th century, yeah. wow. It's historic cobbled stone streets, pastel houses, charming corners with musicians. A reminder of the sights, the sounds, and the life Ukraine is fighting for. Wow, that was an incredible story. Maggie, really, thank you to you. Uh, still to come here, the eviction moratorium set to expire in one country, sending protesters into the streets. And on this Women's History Month, we sit down with a trailblazer in the orchestra world and how hard it was for her to break into what was a boys club. 
Ready for a little GMA-ish promo? Okay, here we go. GMA 7A every day with Robin, George, and Michael. That's how you start the day. Boom! Right now, with so much at stake, Sunday mornings, this is the place. Taking on all the tough questions. Straightforward reporting. No spin, no hype, no bull. Thank you for making ABC's This Week with George Stephanopoulos the number one Sunday morning news show versus the competition. Welcome to This Week. Welcome back, everybody. We are tracking several headlines around the world tonight. One of Russia's biggest dance stars, ballerina Olga Smirnova, has quit working with the Bolshoi Ballet Company in protest of Putin's war against Ukraine. She had earlier posted a social media message opposing the war with, quote, all the fibers of my soul, a position she says makes working in Russia untenable as the Kremlin cracks down on free speech. Smirnova has joined the Dutch National Ballet in Amsterdam. And thousands took to the streets in Brazil's two main cities to protest against an eviction moratorium imposed because of COVID-19 that is set to expire at the end of the month. Activists say that more than 130,000 people are at risk of eviction. At the same time, the Brazilian Supreme Court reportedly ordered the nationwide suspension of the messaging app Telegram, which is widely used by Brazil's far-right president. Critics say it can be used to spread fake news. And Finland has been named the world's happiest country for the fifth year in a row, the Aurora Borealis. Ah. Uh, <laughs> with fellow Nordic nations Denmark and Iceland rounding out the top three, scoring for the World Happiness Report considers factors like GDP per capita and social programming, as well as the freedoms that citizens have. It also looks at generosity, and experts cite a global upsurge in benevolence as the world battled the COVID pandemic. And also now here this evening, she is the first woman to serve as the head of a major orchestra in the US, South America, Austria, and Britain. Marin Alsap broke the glass ceiling for so many women in classical music. Phil Lipoff sits down with Marin and the director of the documentary, The Conductor, which showcases the challenges of being a woman in classical music. I went to my violin teacher and I said, you know, I saw this amazing conductor and I, I'm gonna be the conductor. And she said, and girls can't do that. Being the first is a tough job. And I think this is why she's fighting so much for us. When did you first understand that you wanted to do this? My parents were both professional musicians, so I had to become a musician. So there was no, there was no getting out of that. So that was a given. And I played piano and then I played violin, but it was really when I saw, I went to a concert and I saw this conductor, Leonard Bernstein, mm. and he was so charismatic and so engaged and so communicative. I thought, okay, I can do this classical music thing because this guy's having fun. So I have to be the conductor. It wasn't until I was in my 20s that I could start to really get something going in terms of that. And, you know, it was a, it was a challenging road because it's challenging regardless. But in those days, you know, there are very, very few women. And uh, I couldn't get into school because, you know, conducting is tricky because unless you have experience, you can't get exposure, but you can't get experience unless you do it. In the documentary, you say, don't tell me I can't do something. <laughs> um, and I mean, the, 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 your credentials go on and on and on. The first woman to serve as the head of a major orchestra in the United States, South America, Austria, and Britain. I mean, you were ahead of your time when you said that, but I think a lot of people are being taught now to say, don't tell me I can't do something. What does that phrase mean to you? This idea of telling someone they can't do something is so debilitating and so controlling and so manipulative. You can do anything you want to do. And I had parents like that as well, you know, and they were ahead of their time. But they said, okay, you know, if this is what you want to do, absolutely, you can do it. And it's so important for kids to have that, especially from their parents initially. A hero and a teacher of yours said while well, listening to you conduct, and this is a quote, um, I don't get it. When I close my eyes, I can't tell that you're a woman. And that's the first thing I thought of when I heard your story. Music is music, 
gender is probably the least distinctive influencing factor. But I do think that, you know, it's it's more about leadership in in that case when people are resistant to a woman on the podium. It's more about letting go of this archetypal image of what the conductor's supposed to look like. There's absolutely no no distinction in between men and women. You know, when Leonard Bernstein said that he couldn't tell I was a woman, I I would have thought, now is that a compliment? And what should I do? What should I say? But I understood that he was you know, he was trying to wrap his mind around it because he was from a, a generation that never considered women in these roles. So he was just trying to get used to it. You obviously know that you're an inspiration to many. Um, you're a mentor. A lot of women hoping to become conductors. Instead of asking what you have taught them or what you tell them, have you learned anything from them? I started a fellowship in 2002 for women conductors, and there are 30 recipients of the uh, awards. and. They are all really changing the world through music. They're trying to create equality. They're trying to create representation. They're trying to create opportunities. What made you want to tell Marin's story? Women's stories are in, in feminism. And as it turned out, you know, this is exactly my field. I was so taken by Marin's story and I was so lucky to have access, you know, as a filmmaker to her here. This documentary will empower women not just yeah. to be a conductor, but to be anything they really want to be. But why do you think it, it traditionally has been so hard and still is, in a way, uh, hard for women to be the first? Well, you know, so if somebody is in control, uh, they're very unlikely to step back and say, you know, we've been in control for all this time, so now it's your turn, you know? They know the music and they and they receive the music and um, they admire the music, but they don't really know too much about what's behind the scenes. And I think here, particularly in the United States, that's the case, you know, because um, it is a very specialized art form. And I think the combination of the two makes for the fact that uh, the sexism and misogyny is able to, to pass and to happen without people actually noticing. What do you hope people get from Marin's story? I really wanted to give my admiration for Marin and, 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 and what she has accomplished in this discipline as a woman, but also really as a musician. I want them to, you know, believe in themselves and be inspired to do whatever they want to do, as I'm sure Marin would say so. So this is not a film mm -hmm. to make people musicians, but to believe uh, in their passion. What do you want young women to take away from your story? I think the most important thing that I, I'd like to share is that perseverance, hard work, and really never taking no for an answer. If you can hang on to those things, you can succeed. It may be difficult, it may be a very hard path sometimes, you know, but I always think if you're banging at the front door and they won't let you in, just sneak around the side and crawl in the window while they're not looking, and you will succeed. I mean, that is advice to live by. Philip off, thank you for that story. And still to come here, the unlikely heroes who saved the day when no one else could. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. And kicking off this year's March Madness with an unexpected play of the game, two unlikely heroes took to new heights and saved the day when nothing or no one else could. ABC's Will Gans has more. March Madness coming to a standstill in the second half of the Indiana St. Mary's game when this happened. The ball is stuck. We've got an issue now. Who's getting that? 13 feet off the ground, and no combination of mop, referee, and chair was able to get it down. 
until two unlikely heroes stepped up. The Jets get the cheerleader up. Get her up there. This is how you do it. Give her the mob. Now she's got it. Oh, what a play. The cheerleader saves the day. That's Cassidy Cerny, sophomore cheerleader at Indiana University. I jokingly was like, Put me up, like, I can go get it. A joke until it wasn't, when she was asked to team up with senior Nathan Paris. Our captain, Ethan, um, looked over at all of us and were like, I think we need to put somebody up in a stunt. But only one of them was nervous when the national spotlight fell on them. I'm glad she wasn't nervous, because I was. I was <laughs> like, oh, I really need to catch this one right here. After the game-saving play... This place is on its feet! in the stadium and online. Highlight of the game, best moment of March Madness so far. The internet is losing its mind right now over this moment. What is that like for you guys? Scary. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's scary, it's scary, but it's exciting. And, you know, just getting one crazy reaction makes it all worth it. And even though the Hoosiers lost. Just being able to bring that exposure to my team was Really fun. Once in a lifetime. Yeah. I love that story. My husband is an IU grad, by the way. Wasn't too happy with the loss, though. Well, that's our show for tonight. Stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Kana Whitworth. Thank you so much for streaming with us. He thought he was God. He's now one of the most vilified men in the world. He is the everyman. Zelensky is the Tom Hanks of Ukraine. The fact that a little nice Jewish boy is 5'7 is showing up this KGB agent in the Kremlin. What do you say to Americans who see Russia and you not only as a rival, but an unfriendly adversary? Two men at war. Which Vladimir will take over? The world is not going to be the same. GMA Monday. Oh, are we doing this now? Yeah, we're oh. doing it now. Sandra Bullock, <laughs> Michael Strahan. It's you! So what did Sandra say that led to this? Preach! Oh, Jesus. <laughs> Monday. You're talking to me right here to the heart. Go on, I love it. Only on Good Morning America. Tonight, as we come on the air in the West, several developing stories. For the first time, Russia striking in Lviv, Ukraine, just 40 miles from the Poland border. And breaking news tonight amid NATO exercises in Europe, the missing American Osprey tonight and the search for on board. But first, verified videos circulating on social media showing explosions near the airport in Lviv. Ukraine says the missiles came from Russian aircraft firing from the Black Sea. Four missiles appearing to hit the target, two intercepted. Lviv, Ukraine, until now, had been a safe place for tens of thousands of refugees, one of their last stops in Ukraine before getting out. Tonight, Russia's foreign minister and his new threat to the U.S. and the West, calling new military shipments legitimate targets. Stark new images here of a bombed-out Mariupol tonight and the staggering new report on the humanitarian crisis. Vladimir Putin in public in Moscow today, his declaration and the powerful scene back in Lviv, Ukraine tonight, 109 strollers representing the 109 children killed since the war began. Martha Raddatz standing by live in Ukraine, Viktor Kendo live in Poland tonight. President Biden and the high stakes phone call with China's President Xi today, the nearly two hour conversation after reports Russia asked China for help, military help, potentially economic help amid crippling sanctions. Mary Bruce live at the White House on what was said on that call. Tonight, Arnold Schwarzenegger, who is extraordinarily popular inside Russia, and his very personal plea direct to Russian soldiers. You will hear it, what Schwarzenegger says about his own father and his message to Vladimir Putin tonight. Back here at home, the pandemic tonight, and Moderna now requesting emergency authorization for a fourth shot, another booster, for all adults in this country. Dr. Jha tonight, should Americans prepare for another booster given the rise in cases of this highly transmissible Omicron subvariant? The severe weather threat at this hour from Florida all the way up to New York State. Dangerous storms damaging homes already, at least six people hospitalized. Ginger Z times this out as we start the weekend. 
The stunning upset kicking off March Madness and the other moment, the cheerleaders saving the day. And the Russian ballet star tonight, her message to Vladimir Putin and where she has now ended up. From ABC News World Headquarters in New York, this is World News Tonight with David Muir. Good evening, and it's great to have you with us as we near the end of another week together. And we begin tonight with the war in Ukraine. For the first time since the Russian invasion, missiles today hitting Lviv, Ukraine, about 40 miles from the Polish border. Until now, Lviv has been considered relatively safe, especially for the tens of thousands of refugees trying to get out of that country still. The target hit with missiles fired from the Black Sea. A verified image posted on social media showing a missile exploding as it hits near the airport in Lviv. Ukraine claims Russia fired six missiles that two were intercepted. A senior defense official reporting with Russian ground troops stalled outside Kyiv and other cities that the Russians are increasingly using artillery and long-range missiles, which is what we've now seen in Lviv. The haunting scenes out of Mariupol tonight and the UN with the alarming new report on the humanitarian crisis. Nearly six and a half million people displaced inside Ukraine. That's in addition to the more than three million who have already left. Well, more than 9 million Ukrainians now forced to flee. And in Moscow tonight, Vladimir Putin center stage at a massive pro-war rally, falsely accusing Ukrainians of genocide, praising Russian troops as heroes. And the moment state TV appeared to cut away from his speech, what the Kremlin insists tonight, President Biden and China's President Xi speaking for nearly two hours today. Russia has reportedly asked China for help, military help or economic help, given these crippling sanctions. So Mary Bruce is standing by at the White House tonight with what we've learned about the call. Also tonight, Arnold Schwarzenegger and his very personal plea to the Russians, to Russian soldiers directly. He is very popular in Russia and the message about his own father. But we are going to begin tonight with this newest Russian target, Lviv, Ukraine. And that's where our chief global affairs correspondent, Martha Raditz, leads us off tonight. Tonight, for the first time, Russia attacking Lviv, a bustling city which was considered a safe haven just 40 miles from Poland. <sighs> Verified video circulating on social media showing two of the explosions slamming into an aircraft repair facility near the main airport. The Russians firing six cruise missiles from the Black Sea, hundreds of miles away, at least two of the missiles were intercepted before they could reach their target. With today's missile strike just there beyond the airport, the Russians are sending a powerful message. Lviv has been a critical place for refugees trying to get out of Ukraine and a critical pipeline for humanitarian aid and supplies. And tonight, the sheer scope of the refugee crisis now all too clear. A U.N. agency today estimating that six and a half million people have been displaced inside Ukraine since the fighting began. Over three million have already fled the country, meaning nearly a quarter of Ukraine's population has been displaced. Russia's foreign minister, Sergei Lavrov, further raising tensions with the West today, warning that any military shipments to Ukraine will be considered legitimate targets. Any uh, cargo moving into Ukrainian territory, which uh, we would believe uh, is carrying weapons, uh, would be a fair game. Lavrov's boss, Vladimir Putin, appeared at a huge rally in Moscow today before a flag-waving crowd of thousands, Putin repeated false claims that Russia's invasion was meant to prevent the genocide of Russian speakers in eastern Ukraine. Putin's speech was abruptly interrupted when the feed cut away to a lively musical performance in the stadium, the Kremlin dismissing it as a technical glitch. Putin used the speech to praise his troops. But the reality is Putin's ground forces are stalled on the battlefield as the fighting enters its fourth week, prompting him to increasingly turn to long-range weapons staged in Russia itself to wage his war. The drawn-out fight and Putin's desperation has the U.S. and NATO worried that 
Putin will turn to even deadlier tactics, including chemical, biological, or even small yield battlefield nuclear weapons to break the stalemate. The use of nuclear weapons on the battlefield is part of Russian military doctrine, and the horrors it could unleash risk involving the U.S. and NATO more deeply in this conflict. These are smaller yield, smaller weapons, but they still carry lots of radioactivity, and they're still a big step along the scale of escalation to strategic nuclear war. Ukrainian and Russian officials did hold a fifth straight day of ceasefire talks. Russia's lead negotiator tonight claiming the two sides have moved much closer on the question of Ukraine giving up any ambitions to join NATO. But Ukraine saying it has agreed to nothing and wants an immediate ceasefire, Russian troop withdrawal and international security guarantees. As the talks drag on, the suffering only gets worse. In the besieged city of Mariupol, it's still not clear how many casualties there may have been after a Russian airstrike on a theater serving as a shelter. Seen here in images from the Azov Battalion, a far-right paramilitary group now part of the Ukrainian National Guard. Ukrainian officials say as many as 1,000 people were inside. At least 130 people have reportedly been rescued, but hundreds remain unaccounted for. In the capital, Kyiv, another round of shelling today. Emergency responders racing to save civilians and put out fires triggered by the indiscriminate attacks. And back in Lviv, a heartbreaking moment today as 109 empty baby strollers were lined up in a city square to symbolize the 109 Ukrainian children killed in this war so far. Just an extraordinary image tonight. Martha Raddatz with us live from Lviv. And Martha, that city, again, not far from the Poland border, of course. And you and I were on the air last night. Your sources had been telling you the Russians would be relying more and more on long-range weapons because the ground troops are stalled, the Russian ground troops. And it would appear that that's what we're seeing here. Exactly, David. Vladimir Putin is frustrated by the pace of this invasion, especially those bogged down convoys around Kyiv. And we've heard Putin remind the world that Russia is a new intelligence agency, saying Russia will use that rhetoric to project strength, but there is no hard intelligence, as far as we know, indicating he will actually use those weapons. But it is a concern, David. And Martha, while we have you, the other breaking headline as we're on the air, we know of these NATO exercises elsewhere in Europe. What do you know tonight about reports of a missing American Osprey uh, somewhere in Europe tonight? Well, there is a search and rescue underway for crew members on board that Osprey. They're taking part in these huge NATO exercises in Norway, joined by 3,000 U.S. Marines. David? All right, Martha Raddatz leading us off here on a Friday night. Martha, thank you. And as you heard Martha report there, the humanitarian crisis is worsening now. Six million people displaced inside Ukraine. More than three million more have already fled that country. In neighboring Poland, millions are now seeking help. Victor Akendo from Warsaw. Tonight, the displaced just keep coming from every corner of war-ravaged Ukraine, overwhelming major cities like Warsaw. But just 40 minutes away in the town of Milanovic, a community opening their doors to those most in need. And to be clear, you've never met before, right? This mother and son fleeing Ukraine those bags containing all they could carry, but instead of staying in a shelter, a local Polish woman taking them to stay with her mother. Of the more than three million refugees spreading to countries throughout Europe, more than two million are in Poland. In this town of just 16,000 people, they've welcomed 600 refugees. Well, there's no way, I, as a dad, I can look at mums with kids, right, and not cry and think, what can we do? Andrew Edel's offering his spare cottage to 14-year-old Oleva's family. Oleva, pictured here with his younger sister, mother, and grandmother last May, fleeing Kharkiv along with his cousin after spending days inside this bomb shelter with their dog. Here it's uh, way better. First of all, no explosions. So you feel safer here? I feel way safer here. Tonight, all have a roof over their heads and beds to call their own. Poland is now providing refugees with the equivalent of social security numbers. This will allow them to legally find work or apply for a mortgage. In just one day, 123,000 Ukrainians were provided those new numbers. David? Victor Kendo from Warsaw tonight. Victor, thank you.
Tonight, President Biden and his high-stakes phone call with China's President Xi, their phone call lasting nearly two hours today. President Biden warning of the consequences if China provides Russia with military or economic help. But the White House insisting the president made no specific requests of President Xi. Our Mary Bruce pressing the White House on that very point today. A senior official said that the president was really sort of laying out his assessment of the situation to President Xi, that he was making clear the implications of certain actions, but that President Biden wasn't making specific requests of China. Why not, and given the stakes here? Because China has to make a decision for themselves about where they want to stand uh, and how they want the history books to uh, look at them and view their actions. Uh, and uh, that is a decision for President Xi and the Chinese to make. So let's bring in Mary Bruce. She's live at the White House tonight. The, the White House obviously very cautious as they negotiate here anything involving Russia uh, with China. David, the White House describes this call as detailed, direct, and substantive, but tonight they aren't sharing those details. The administration believes it's more constructive for them to be tight-lipped about these talks. We do know that President Biden laid out for the Chinese president the serious implications and consequences of aligning with Russia, but it's not clear if President Xi got the message. In a lengthy but vague statement, the Chinese called it a candid and in-depth discussion, but they're also holding their cards close. Tonight, we still don't know if China has decided to help Russia, either economically or militarily, or if China is going to denounce Russia's invasion. The Chinese still calling this war a, quote, situation in Ukraine. David. Mary Bruce, live at the White House. We'll be watching this closely. Mary, thank you. Tonight, we're learning more here about a very personal message from Arnold Schwarzenegger, who is extraordinarily popular inside Russia. His plea direct to Russian soldiers. What Schwarzenegger says about his own father and his message to Vladimir Putin tonight. The question, of course, how many Russians will see and hear this? Here's ABC's Matt Guppen. Tonight, there's no way of knowing just how many Russians have seen the message from Arnold Schwarzenegger. But he is extraordinarily popular there. And this was personal, his plea to stop the war. I'm sending this message through various different channels to reach my dear Russian friends and the Russian soldiers serving in Ukraine. He told the Russian people and soldiers, you are not being told the truth. I ask you to help me spread the truth. Let your fellow Russians know the human catastrophe that is happening in Ukraine. Gentle and fatherly, the former California governor and actor begins with a story about his own boyhood hero, a Russian, Yuri Vlasov, then the world's strongest man. Let me just tell you about the Russian who became my hero. In 1961, when I was 14 years old, he reached out to shake my hand. <laughs> he was kind, and he smiled at me. I will never forget that day. Never. His story, a way to connect personally with the Russian soldiers. And Schwarzenegger, just one of three American public figures followed by the Russian presidency on Twitter. And he has a message for President Putin. To President Putin, I say, you started this war. You are leading this war. You can stop this war. Schwarzenegger then telling Russian soldiers about his own father and the guilt he carried fighting for the Nazis in World War II. He says his dad came home a broken man. He lived the rest of his life in pain, pain from a broken back, pain from the shrapnel that always reminded him of these terrible years, and pain from the guilt that he felt. Schwarzenegger closing by saying those brave enough to stand up to Putin and against this war are his new heroes. The world has seen your bravery. We know that you have suffered the consequences of your courage. You have the strength of Yuri Petrovich Vlasov. David, the White House telling us it did not direct Arnold Schwarzenegger to produce that video. A spokesman for the former governor saying it came from Arnold's heart, not the government. Now, his team managing to post that video onto Telegram, one of the few social media outlets that has managed to evade censorship in Russia. David. And so interesting that Schwarzenegger is followed by the Russian presidency. Matt Gutman tonight. Matt, thank you. Our coverage of the war in Ukraine tonight. In the meantime, back here at home into the pandemic tonight, Moderna has now requested emergency authorization for a fourth shot, another booster for all adults in this country. Dr. Jha tonight on whether Americans should begin to prepare for this possibility amid rising cases of this highly transmissible Omicron subvariant. Here's Witt Johnson now. Tonight, in the latest push for another booster, Moderna now formally requesting emergency use authorization for a fourth shot for all adults. It comes just days after Pfizer made the same request for Americans 65 and older. 
Dr. Ashish Jha, just named the new White House Coronavirus Response Coordinator, says they have to follow the evidence. It may very well end up being that the fourth shot is helpful, particularly for high-risk people. Um, we want to see the full set of data and then I think make a decision after that. The concern is waning immunity. New research from Israel shows that a fourth shot boosted antibodies back up to levels seen after a third dose, but didn't significantly reduce the risk of infection. In the U.S., half of those eligible still haven't gotten any booster. And now with BA2, a more infectious Omicron subvariant, making up nearly a quarter of all cases across the country, health officials say it's more critical than ever to get that first booster. Anybody who's not gotten boosted uh, needs to do that. I think if we do that, we may get a small surge, but it's going to be kept to a minimum. We're going to be able to get through this. Health experts are closely watching the U.K. and Europe, where BA2 is fueling a resurgence. The U.S. usually follows trends in the U.K. by about three weeks. But tonight, Dr. Fauci is encouraged by one key metric. British hospitals are not yet reporting an increasing demand for ICU beds. You're not seeing an increase in intensive care unit beds usage nor are they seeing any increase in all-cause mortality. So we just need to keep an eye out on it. And David, the FDA is set to take up the issue of a potential fourth shot in April. The review could include boosters for both Pfizer and Moderna. David. Witt Johnson with us here tonight. Witt, thank you. When we come back, we're also tracking severe storms tonight into tomorrow. Millions on alert from the south all the way up into New York. Ginger Z standing by to time this out for us. More Americans choose ABC News, America's number one news source. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24-7. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. It was a scary time in the 70s. You had multiple bodies showing up in Los Angeles. There were so many murders happening. You had to have a name for it. Serial killer. There was a human head in there. This was premeditated evil. You have this clock. This person is going to do this again. It's me against the killer. Who's going to win? We'll see who laughs last. Pat. What came next was unlike anything they had ever seen. He thought he was God. He's now one of the most vilified men in the world. He is the everyman. Zelensky is the Tom Hanks of Ukraine. The fact that a little nice Jewish boy is 5'7 is showing up this KGB agent in the Kremlin. What do you say to Americans who see Russia and you not only as a rival, but an unfriendly adversary. Two men at war. Which Vladimir will take over? The world is not going to be the same. Christopher Steele, the guy who picked a fight with two presidents, and he's lived to tell the tale. That now infamous dossier. Supposedly a tape showing prostitutes hired by Donald Trump urinating on a bed. It would be quite a tape if it in fact existed. I said take out the PP pee -pee tape. It quickly became a question of how much of this was accurate. This is the stuff of movies. A lot of this is the stuff of movies. The story of epic proportions. Phony stuff. It's a bunch of crap. It changed history. The deeper you go into the black market, the darker it gets. Traffic Wednesdays at 9 on National Geographic. Ready for a little GMA-ish promo? OK, here we go. GMA 7A every day with Robin, George, and Michael. That's how you start the day. Boom. We are tracking severe weather tonight from Florida all the way up into New York. Dangerous storms already damaging homes. At least six hospitalized in southern Alabama. Let's get right to Chief Meteorologist Ginger Z tracking it all. Hey, Ginger. 
Hey, David, of the 21 severe storm reports, two tornadoes in the panhandle of Florida. So what we see right now is a line moving east. It's all with that cold front, and an I-95 corridor is going to become the target area tomorrow. So that's Wilmington, it's Charleston, down to Savannah, but also there's that little bubble that includes Syracuse and parts of central Pennsylvania, mostly tomorrow afternoon and evening. So if you have outdoor plans on Saturday, please beware if you're in that yellow. And then we'll start spring on Sunday, officially 11. 33 a.m. Eastern time, and then that new storm comes in Monday. It looks like it could be tornadic in Texas. We will be following it, David. All right. Thank you, Ginger. We'll see you next week. When we come back here, the big March Madness upset and the cheerleader saving the day. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any place else. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast, now streaming on ABC News Live. I risked my life. I put my family in danger. If I was caught, they would have put a bullet in my head. But it was the right thing to do. It was the only thing to do. Plot foiled in Garden City, Kansas. That would have been one of the most deadly acts of domestic terrorism ever in the United States. It would have been Oklahoma City. He put his family himself in jeopardy for us. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24-7. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. National parks are incredibly safe places, but crime will happen. My wife had fallen in really critical condition. At that time, I thought it was just a tragic accident. There's still a lot of questions we need to ask. There were small things that didn't totally add up. This is two lives for Harold that have died now. I was shocked. Something's not right. To the index in March Badness, one of the top seeds has fallen. St. Peter's beating number two Kentucky. And one of the most memorable moments of the tournament so far belongs to an Indiana cheerleader. After several attempts by players, it was the cheer squad getting the ball dislodged there. You probably saw it. Never underestimate the cheerleaders. When we come back here, the Russian ballet star tonight speaking out against Putin's war and where she's ended up. It was an extraordinary story. A computer salesman was supposed to report to prison to begin a 17-year sentence. They let him turn himself into jail with no escort. No one thought he would run. How do you evade capture for 25 years? How do you do that? Now, join the search, following the U.S. Marshals as they uncover new leads in a global manhunt. Can you help catch this fugitive? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Listen and join the all-new hunt wherever you get your podcasts. The deeper you go into black markets, the darker it gets. Traffic, Wednesdays at 9 on National Geographic. Right now, with so much at stake, Sunday mornings, this is the place. Taking on all the tough questions, straightforward reporting, no spin, no hype, no bull. Thank you for making ABC's This Week with George Stephanopoulos, the number one Sunday morning news show versus the competition. Welcome to This Week. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24 Seven. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. The president calls him a war criminal as Putin's war rages on. The innocent victims, the refugees, and Ukraine fights on. Now, Sunday, breaking new details from the war zone. And will new interest rates help our economy? Sunday on ABC's This Week with George. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted. And streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. 
This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news. Free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. Finally tonight here, the Russian ballet star speaking out against the war. Tonight, the star Russian ballerina bravely speaking out against the war against Vladimir Putin. Olga Smirnova has performed with the famed Bolshoi Ballet in Moscow as a principal dancer for more than a decade. This week, she quit the company, protesting the war against Ukraine. Writing online, she opposes the war with all the fibers in my soul. I never thought I would be ashamed of Russia. We cannot remain indifferent to the global catastrophe. And tonight, the interview with Olga Smirnova on the power of speaking out. If I need to speak what I think is right to speak, and if I need to leave the country for that, I will leave the country. She has already joined the Dutch National Ballet in Amsterdam. Her first performance with them will be next month, and opening night is already sold out. This war was started by Russia. War, it's not the method to resolve the conflicts in our society. The brave ballet star taking a stand, her first performance with the Dutch National Ballet, already sold out. I'm David Muir. I'll see you Monday. Good night. The most powerful stories of our time, anytime. Nightline. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. Admit it, these days what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA 3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. I know what happened and I'm not guilty. Why the fascination with criminal trials? Figure out what's really out there. She revealed she had murdered his family. I know in my heart that he did this. It's the time of suspicion. The ending's really tough. You don't know whether truth is going to be difficult to find unless you try to find it. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news. Free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. Stadium in Moscow as Russian President Vladimir Putin took center stage at a pro-war rally, praising his military despite what the world is watching. Missiles strike Lviv, Russian aircraft firing on the city in western Ukraine, just 40 miles from Poland's border, where NATO territory begins. Deadly new attacks in Kyiv, and the harrowing search for survivors after that theater turned shelter was hit in Mariupol. All as the refugee crisis grows even more dire, and some Ukrainians and Russians arrive at the southern border of the United States. High stakes diplomacy, a nearly two hour call between President Biden and Chinese leader Xi about what to do in Ukraine, days after Putin turned to China for help. What each superpower is saying tonight, and the personal plea from Arnold Schwarzenegger to the Kremlin. Bull to the world with lives upended by war, how some caught in the conflict are using platforms like TikTok to shine a light on what's really happening. I guess this is a bomb shelter. 
that is close to my house. And sending a powerful message on social media. I did not expect it to go that viral, uh, but then I understood that this is a powerful tool. A COVID reality check as cases once again climb around the world and concern grows over a far more transmissible Omicron subvariant. Moderna has joined Pfizer in requesting emergency authorization for a fourth shot. What do Americans need to know? Dr. Alok Patel is here. And the Festival of Colors, billions across India flooding the streets for Holi, a Hindu celebration of spring and a day of unlimited joy with food, dance, and fun. I need a lot of help here. <laughs> <laughs> yep, that's it. One. Well, good evening, everyone. I'm Kana Whitworth here in Los Angeles, in for Lindsay Davis, and thank you so much for streaming with us. Now, we begin tonight with the war in Ukraine and a new flashpoint as Russian President Vladimir Putin hits a target not far from where NATO territory begins in Poland. Airstrikes for the first time in the western Ukrainian city of Lviv captured here. This is verified image posted on social media showing a missile explosion near the airport. That is just 40 miles from Poland's border, a city now home to more than a million Ukrainian refugees. And in Mariupol, a search for signs of life after Russia